Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, I know we can all agree that our transit system needs repair and investments. That is undeniable. There is a little less agreement on how we should go about doing that. People are passionate about the issue, and at Abney, we love being a forum for people who are passionate about issues. So today we'll hear from people who have different approaches. We'll hopefully find some common ground and learn a little more. It is our great pleasure to have Errol Lewis, the anchor from New York One, to moderate this panel. He has a great skill at getting to the heart of the matter, and we're grateful for his time. We're also grateful for our distinguished panel. Ladies and gentlemen, Errol Lewis. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining us. We're going to um, move quickly into the discussion. We're going we're to talk uh, for about uh, 45 minutes and then invite you to join the discussion about uh, an important topic or topics. And we're going to make sure throughout panelists that we uh, make a clear distinction between congestion pricing as a way to fund the MTA, which is kind of where the proposal is right now, I guess, politically speaking, and congestion pricing as a way to deal with congestion, which is a, a related but very different kind of a proposition. And we're going to make sure, my job this morning is going to be to make sure we don't do too much mixing and matching. Um, there are layers of complexity to this, of course, and we have an ideal panel to help us uh, get through all of it. Uh, their uh, longer biographies are uh, in the programs that are on your seat. You know most of these people anyhow, but uh, let me just say for uh, the record, because we are recording this, Scott Reckler is the CEO and chairman of RxR Realty. Veronica Vanderpool um, is the principal of V Squared LLC and she is a board member of the MTA. Uh, we have uh, David Weprin here, an assemblyman, former council member. Uh, he's from Queens. He has um, a couple of views about this topic that we've heard about from time to time. And uh, Patrick Hyland is the executive director of the New York Metropolitan Trucking Association. Let's, um, let's get right to it, and I want to ask um, Scott and Veronica to uh, take just a couple of minutes and tell us what you like about the proposal that's lumped together as congestion pricing. And I, you can talk about the parts of it that most appeal to you, the parts that are most important. Wh where do you think it will leave the city if some version of this gets passed in the next few weeks? I'll take the uh, first, and then uh, Veronica, you can clean up everything I miss. And, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Abney, for having us all here uh, today. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, you know, the, the key here right now is New York faces uh, two major problems, right? We face a transit system that's uh, in crisis, that is in dire need of uh, a new sustainable uh, revenue source that's dedicated to rebuilding um, the subway system for, for the future, which is something that uh, we don't even have the current revenue in place to actually maintain the current system, let alone bring it to the future. At the second time, the problem we have is we have incredible congestion uh, on our streets, historic congestion. We have um, the slowest traffic patterns that we've ever had in New York City. People aren't riding our buses because it's easier to walk, faster to walk, than actually get on a bus that's going about five miles an hour. And I think what's attractive about this plan is it, in a comprehensive way, not only creates a dedicated revenue stream to actually fund the rebuilding of our subway system, but it seeks to tackle the congestion on our streets both by changing behavior of the people that right now drive more into our streets, the four hired vehicles that have grown uh, enormously throughout the, the last uh, three to five years uh, in, our, in our city to about 150,000 four hired vehicles, uh, to deal with the changes in e-commerce and now the amount of deliveries uh, that have grown where trucks are now up, truck delivery service up about 30% in the last three years. Uh, tourism, which has created, again, congestion in our streets, Tourist bus are up four times over the last three years. And think about tourist bus, they're paid to go slow down the middle of the road so that people can actually look at buildings, right? So all these things have changed. So not only is it about changing behaviors of our riders that come into the central business district, but it's also about trying to create enforcement uh, opportunities for the city, using cameras to be able to get uh, cars uh, out, out of the bus lanes, um, double parking of trucks, um, cars and, and trucks that are blocking the box. So we need to increase the capacity of our existing infrastructure and we need to fix 
our transit system at the same time. And I believe this congestion pricing plan seeks to accomplish it. I will you know, say from the very beginning, that this is as much of an art and science, and there's a lot of uh, different approaches to how to deal with this. And so I, I think the principles are what we should focus on, and the details is really something that the legislature is going to have to work out. And it's about having dis discourse and feedback from all the constituents to try to figure out what best plan should be uh, ultimately uh, implemented. I'm going to end with just one point, which is that I think the other key element of the plan was a recognition that this isn't going to change overnight. This is going to be something that needs to be phased in. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to start charging congestion pricing and push people down to a subway system that's not capable of handling that extra capacity when it, when it has the current challenges it has today. So this was a plan that's meant to be phased in over a couple of years, which I think would give us all a chance to adapt and give our system a chance to be upgraded to a level we can handle the additional uh, capacity needs. Good morning. The fixed NYC proposal is an important first step in this discussion. We've been debating congestion pricing for 11 years, and during that 11-year time frame, congestion has increased by 56%. The cost of congestion have increased from 13 billion to 20 billion. Our subway system is seeing a decline in ridership for two consecutive years. Our bus system is hemorrhaging riders by the millions. Personal auto use is increasing by 9%. Traffic on our bridges and tunnels is increasing while transit ridership is decreasing. The average speed of vehicles in Manhattan has dropped 23% to five miles per hour, and 1,502 pedestrians have been killed in New York City during those 11 years by vehicles. These are the statistics that we are talking about right now because we did not pass congestion pricing 11 years ago. What new statistics will we be talking about in 10 years if we don't pass some sort of congestion pricing, if we don't pass a proposal or a plan now? Right now, instead of discussing the statistics that I just noted, we should be talking about the benefits and the positive impacts that we've seen to our subway system, our bus system, our congestion, um, our pedestrian fatality rate, the increase in productivity for our businesses and our commercial industry. That, those are the statistics that we should be talking about. But because of inaction 11 years ago, I had to cite the statistics that we have. One key point that I want to know is the issue of regressivity. That has been a constant and consistent refrain in this conversation. The Community Service Society, which is one of the premier social service organizations whose sole mission is to advocate for low-income and middle-income individuals and the working poor, has put out an analysis that says 2% of the working poor, 5,000 individuals, would be impacted by a congestion pricing fee. It is not credible to continue to say that congestion pricing is a regressive policy. It is not credible to defend, to, to defend that position when all the research that has been done over the 11 years indicates otherwise. Particularly, I don't understand how one can take a position opposing that of community service society. Again, the premier social service uh, organization that is advocating for low-income individuals has taken a position that congestion pricing is not regressive. So it is not defensible to continue to purport that this is progressive transportation policy. I'll end by saying progressive transportation policy is that which generates revenue to reinvest back into our transportation network. Our subways and our buses primarily, but making sure that we have the adequate bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure to support other modes of transportation. That is because this is a city predominantly of transit users. 54.5% of households in New York City do not own a car. We rely on public transportation to get around. So any amount of revenue that is reinvested into our system generates benefits those who are mobility impaired, those who have limited means, those who are older adults, and those who do not have any other choice. Thank you. Okay. Um, D D D David Weprin, um, you've led protests against um, some of these proposals. Uh, you come from uh, an area that you've described to me as a transportation desert uh, from the standpoint of public transportation. but. Um, wh wh what most concerns you, and are you concerned about being, I guess, um, on the side of the status quo in light of some of the numbers you just heard? No, no, I, I don't support the status quo. I think we have to do something about congestion in midtown Manhattan. 
uh, and I think we have to do something about a revenue stream for the MTA. Uh, I just don't think uh, we should do that on the backs of uh, not poor uh, residents in Queens, but middle class uh, residents in Queens and small businesses rely on their car. That statistic that was cited about most people not owning cars, that may apply to Manhattan, but uh, most people in Queens own two cars, uh, you know, certainly in a, in a family, and uh, really rely on their cars for public transporta for transportation uh, everywhere. Uh, even if they were going to go uh, to the subway or to a bus, they would have to drive there. Uh, and in many cases, uh, residents of Eastern Queens, where there is no subway, have to take two buses to a subway. Uh, and it often a commute to Midtown Manhattan, which normally by driving would be about an hour. It might not be a pleasant experience because there is traffic, but it may take as much as two hours uh, relying on public transportation. Also, public transportation is not there yet uh, for the disability community, and it has a long way to go. Uh, there are a lot of uh, disabled individuals that can only uh, go by car. And there are many people going to hospitals uh, in Manhattan, uh, Sloan Kettering, uh, which is not available uh, in Queens and in other boroughs, and they rely on their cars to get there. But we should reduce congestion. Uh, the major contributor to congestion in the last couple of years has been the uh, app-based uh, car services, uh, Uber and Lyft. Uh, they've uh, caused gridlock in Manhattan, uh, and we have to do something about that. We also have to enforce existing traffic laws. We have to deal with uh, deliveries uh, in the middle of the day, and I think the mayor has started uh, a plan, which I think is a good one, uh, limiting deliveries uh, to certain hours and not during uh, rush hours. Uh, I'd love to see deliveries uh, at night and to give incentives to uh, businesses to have deliveries between midnight and 6 a.m., which would also reduce congestion. It wouldn't punish businesses, but we would give them an incentive uh, to do that uh, from midnight to 6 a.m. So uh, yes, I'm for uh, reducing congestion. I'm for uh, a revenue stream, which we're discussing in Albany for the MTA. I just don't think this congestion zone or tolls on the free bridges, which have been free since 1911, uh, is the way to do it. And uh, certainly it will have uh, a disproportionate effect on residents who rely on their cars from Queens, Brooklyn, Nassau, Suffolk, uh, Staten Island, etc. Okay. I think I saw a little eye roll from Patrick Hyland when you mentioned uh, when and where delivery should take place. Uh, in all seriousness, trucking, of course, is um, sort of a catch-all phrase for a very complicated logistical dance that is responsible for all of the food that we had this morning and the, the fact that we can provision this city of eight plus million every single day. What are your concerns about this and um, why have, has it been characterized as unfairly targeting your industry? Thank you, Errol. We can get into the mayor's plan, but I don't want to dominate this conversation. I'll just touch on that briefly because I disagree with the assemblyman on the tenets of that plan. As a director of an employer's association that performs heavy construction work in the, the five boroughs, Nassau and Suffolk, we have been engaged in this conversation since, not for 11 years, but since I became director about five years and change ago. And there are, as Scott referenced the term, some core principles that I think we are in agreement on. Our concern was where the conversation kind of got to the fix NYC and some of the tenants of that plan. The cost associated with it, the fee for trucks is fairly substantial. Um, it does not take into effect multiple runs per day as we do in the construction industry like some other plans did. It's a concern. Um, the heavy construction industry, we can make anywhere from two to four runs a day, similar to a lot of other delivery companies in the city. There was no real look at how out of whack our toll collection is regionally. I thought that was a missed opportunity of Fix NYC. I hope this discussion can spur on further discussion, really looking at that and making it fairer across the board. And one thing I would like to point out, Fix NYC, I thought did a good job of breaking down by industry and made a point to show that trucks only make up 8% of the vehicles in the congestion zone. And they have to be there, all right? We're, no truck is idling in Midtown because they want to be there. I, I can tell you right now, we don't send, a, our employers don't send a bunch of trucks out and then on the way back say, you know what? 
On the way back, cut down 42nd Street, take a look around, let me know what the, you know, this looks like, that looks like, I'm thinking of going out tonight. The purpose of the trucking industry is to get in and out as efficiently as possible. We have to be there. When we talk about deliveries and construction times, the mayor's plan would be a real logistical nightmare for heavy construction. And a delivery can only be made if a receiver's there. So when we talk about shifting deliveries to nighttime, I, I think we need to make a point. There are some 24-7 industry, the hotel industry of whatnot, that, have, that take a lot of deliveries at night. But do we, do we want nighttime construction in Midtown, in residential areas? We perform nighttime construction. There's nighttime differentials associated with that. There's higher costs associated with that. And that work typically takes place in the airports or on the highways where the residents aren't affected. I don't think we want it in a 24-7 Midtown Manhattan district. So again, we are open to some principles. We just have some concerns with Fix NYC and where this currently stands. I just want to react for a second. First, I'd like to say, I'm not a, I don't love being a debater. I'd rather be a consensus builder along the way. And it's, it sounds, frankly, that there is a lot of consensus. I mean, the first consensus is, I think we all, as much as everyone else, believe and love our city. And you know, one of the things that we're experiencing right now, frankly, is we're a victim of our own success, right? New York City, as we saw last week, has experienced record population growth. The best and brightest from around the world want to come live, they want to come work, and they want to visit New York City. And that's put tremendous pressure on our infrastructure. And it's, it, one of the reasons they have come is quality of life, affordable housing, jobs, and, 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 it's, and the, we've become a magnet for talent, which in this idea-based economy is the number one most important ingredient for any company to be successful. So that's attracted the Googles, the Spotify's, and all these other companies that come here. But we're at a tipping point, right? That this, all this sort of self-positive reinforcement of success of companies and talent coming here will reverse itself if that quality of life doesn't turn, it gets, it gets worse. If the affordability of housing becomes more challenging, if it takes people uh, you know, uh, extra time to get to work that they miss meetings, they can't get home to see their kids, they can't have public transportation to get to a more affordable place to live, it all ties into the success of our ecosystem. And so there's going to have to be trade-offs along the way. And I think that we're, we're talking about some of the trade-offs as to what they are. And I do think, you know, thinking about trucks as an example, I think you raised some fair points, but trucks double parking on the streets as a normal course of business isn't something that can be acceptable in the, in the scope of things here, right? I think there's, there's issues that we have to deal with, and they're hard issues. And um, I think as we, though, look at this, doing nothing is not an option. Because doing nothing means that we're going to end up being in a situation where the great success we have is going to reverse itself. And as I think of the transit crisis that we're in right now, I would compare it to sort of where we were in the early 90s to the crisis that we had with crime, right? The, 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 when people began to recognize and think about the safety of New York, kids didn't want to come here anymore. Talent didn't want to come here anymore. People were moving away. There was a great uh, New York Times, uh, Time Magazine uh, uh, the edition that has the rotting apple on the front of it from 1990 that talked about a poll that said 70% of the people would rather leave New York City than stay here because of the quality of life. If we don't do something, we're going to become that rotting apple versus the shiny apple that we are today. And so, you know, we put forth some concepts um, that I think have a, and, and some elements of it that there is consensus on, but it's going to require some people suffering, you know, a little bit having to pay more than they might otherwise pay. But that's the nature of doing business. Like, I think the point on the trucks, even in terms of coming into the city, I think it, during the night times, we've seen New Yorkers are great at adapting to changes, right? We saw it when we had the summer of hell and the Long Island Railroad crisis. We began to put in new opportunities for people to travel at different times, flex hours, different routes, and everyone adjusted, and we had some of the best performance that we had. If we put into a situation where trucks can deliver and be incented to deliver between 10 a.m. and 6 a.m., that's, that's a, you know, a, a carrot for them for free, and then say, but if you come later, it's a cost. You need some cost, you need a stick, People will adapt, and, and people will say, okay, where I can do that, I will do that. Um, and even in terms of driving cars, right, when you, if, you, if it costs you more, you're going to change your behavior. And I think we've seen that when this has been done in other cities like London, uh, Stockholm, they've adjusted, and that has actually made them their, their ability to deal with congestion that much more effective. Well, well, in, can in, I make one quick yeah. brief point? I appreciate Patrick's points on, that he's made. 
Because what he's touching on is that we have an irrational freight delivery system in this city. While trucks may produce 8% of, of congestion or, or contribute 8% to congestion, they represent 18% of emissions of the transportation sector. The reality is that we have a sector of the industry for which externalities, social, environmental, economic, are not properly, the price of that is not properly affixed. So as part of this discussion, we need to arrive at some different freight models um, because there are some real concerns there. But we can no longer allow vehicles to come into this city, such as these bigger trucks, even the smaller trucks, and deliver more than goods, the economic, the social, the environmental externalities of that delivery, which we depend on. But we need to, uh, again, rationalize our freight delivery system so it's better balanced and the, the equities and, and the imperfections of that are better balanced. Well, but Veronica, say, say a little bit more about who the we is and the, the path we take to sort of do this kind of pricing. I mean, one of the things, we don't have time to do this morning, but I love to do is talk with people about, you know, how'd you get here, right? Like I got up this morning, I walked to the four train, you know, and I was taking a chance. If the four train wasn't there, I was going to take an Uber, right? I mean, and you, t you talk to other people, and there's, there's broad mispricing just across the board, right? I mean, you have people who can come here. If they come around this time, you can get an early bird parking spot for 20, 25 bucks, and it's cheaper than the MTA to commute in from the suburbs. You've got people who uh, it's cheaper to take an Uber for the same reason. Once that's out there, it's, you know, the, the economics will drive the rest of it, right? Who's the convening agency and is there a conversation within the MTA about this sort of broad regional pricing? Patrick referenced uh, the, the toll bridges regionally and, and how it sort of feeds a lot of cars, I know, onto, you know, Canal Street and some other places. So it's a tangential issue. As many of you know, the MTA has implemented all cashless totally on all of its facilities, all its nine bridges and tunnels. So that provides an opportunity to discuss better rationalization of pricing um, and think of new models and new ways. Right now, there's peak and off-peak pricing, but there's more variation between those intervals than we have implemented at this point. With regards to talking more specifically about congestion pricing, Many of you also know that Scott tried to move the board to take a position in support uh, via resolution in support of congestion pricing. And while that didn't happen, there was a good deal of support uh, amongst board members for congestion pricing. The MTA has not taken a position, and in fact, it's something that I think the MTA should do, um, just based on the principles, not take a position on any particular proposal, but take a position on the principles. And again, that's something that Scott had put forth. Mm. And when, when it comes, Patrick, yeah. okay. if I can just touch on a couple of things that Scott and Veronica said as well. Um, I don't think we were at, we, anybody in the trend, trucking world advocates for double parking uh, um, and clogging up the streets, you know, things of that nature. Let me just say, again, I get back to the nighttime, though, and, and the trucks at different times. You need a receiver there. So you can't just incentivize the trucker. You have to incentivize the business owner as well. So if we're going to look at that, it's a deeper dive than on the surface just saying, you know, we're going to shift pricing and the trucks are going to come in at night. Those who can deliver at night, it's my experience, do already. They like it. You know, to get in and out logistically makes the most sense. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that right off the bat. And just again, just speaking from my real estate world, though, we're already adapting. We're building buildings that now have logistic, you know, depositories that even have refrigeration so that people can deliver at night and then people can pick up during the day from there. And I think that is what will happen. You'll end up, if, you know, to the extent that we start changing the cost dynamic and, and, and make it convenient, then people are going to start adapting and society will start adapting. And you'll have depositories where people will drop off a lot of things at night and, and that last mile will either be by foot or they'll be picked up like you're seeing Amazon with the lockers that they have around the city uh, now, right? So there's different tools out there. And I think just the status quo just can't keep going on. But in the heavy construction world, that's a, a challenge. No, I think there's no. I think that's a different yeah. point. I, I wanted to ask you a question, uh, Assemblyman. Um, you're, you're, you've been clear and you've been very public, including this morning, uh, about not uh, imposing a fee on some of your constituents who ha are in a transportation underserved zone, and it makes sense for them to drive. Um, why does that one cost, though? I mean, I own a car, right? So, you know, you got to pay for parking, you got to pay for insurance, you got to pay for the upkeep, you know, the registration and everything else. 
Why is it that that one charge, driving into the Midtown core, is some kind of a deal breaker? Well, no one believes that even if it was a low fee, that it's going to stay a low fee. I mean, history has shown uh, that when we have bridges that are told, it just goes up and up and up. It never goes down uh, or stays the same uh, for too long. So that, that's one thing. Also, there are a number of people uh, in the outer boroughs that go to Manhattan on multiple times a day. Not just once, but twice. Uh, they have family, relatives, uh, go there for business. Uh, we also want to encourage people uh, to go from Queens and Long Island to go into Manhattan uh, for shows, for the theater industry, uh, for restaurants. Uh, we, want, we don't want to hurt the economy there, and, and there are certain uh, theater for one in uh, Manhattan uh, that people have to go into. But, but you're, you're not saying we have to publicly subsidize people coming to Times Square. I'm not saying publicly subsidized, but I just think the right, it's not the right way uh, to toll everybody uh, going into Manhattan. You know, right now we have consumer choice. Uh, I can choose going from where I live uh, to take the Midtown Tunnel and pay a toll, or I could take the Queensboro Bridge and not pay a toll. So you actually have consumer choice now. You have people that are uh, using the tolls because they're often uh, quicker trips, but there are other people that make the decision uh, to take the free bridges because it's an expense that they don't want to incur. 96% of people who are coming into New York City are paying a fare or a fee. 96%. If I ask you to raise your hand, who paid a fee or a fare to come in, most of you would be raising your hands. Assembly member, in your district, I don't think there's a lot of um, discrepancy or disparity in position that there are transit deserts, there are communities that are not well served by transit. 4.2% of residents in your district could be potentially impacted by a congestion pricing charge. And that's according to data released by the Tri-State Transportation Campaign based on census data. 42% of commuters in your district, again, this is district specific for your district 24 in Queens, 42% are using transit to come in. So while, uh, while you're saying that you are concerned about the 4.2%, there are 393,000 commuters in your district alone who are relying on the buses who, quite frankly, I think your energy is better positioned and better spent advocating for that constituency. The numbers are greater. And I want to be fair. You have actually stood with advocates uh, to talk about bus service in your district. And you have talked about the need to improve bus service in your district. You have been at several rallies. You have signed on to letters. So I want to be clear about acknowledging that. But reverting to the regressive argument for 4.2%, I think it's, it's more uh, believable to say you're advocating for 4.2% of drivers and not the 393,000 bus riders in your district. Well, if it's only 4.2%, then why do you need that revenue anyway? I mean, you, 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 how much revenue is it going to achieve if it's only 4.2%? So one is I think it's a lot higher than 4.2%. Uh, not everybody goes into Manhattan every day. Some people go one or two days a week. People go to visit relatives that's not counted in that 4.2%. Uh, people have disabilities that aren't counted uh, in that 4.2%. People go to hospitals in Manhattan uh, that's not counted in the 4.2%. So I, I question that number. But if it's only 4.2%, then you're not going to be losing too much revenue uh, by keeping the, uh, the tolls free or by keeping it, the, a, a, a free entry into Manhattan as an option. But Assembly Member, that's just for your district. We're talking about a congestion pricing right. charge for the entire city. Right. I, I think and I don't think anyone would be in a position to say that MTA cannot use additional money. They can use their money differently, and I think we're getting into that at yes. some point, but every dollar of revenue raised is needed. Yeah, but even the fixed New York City plan was contingent on um, making transit deserts accessible. All right. we've seen uh, from the MTA over the last number of years have been cuts in bus service, not right. increases of bus right. service. And we've had buses in eastern Queens, uh, for example, going north and south, and the MTA's argument about why they eliminated uh, a bus that went uh, from the Little Neck Parkway, which was a lifeline for people in eastern Queens, especially seniors, that relied on going, um, you know, from north to south on Little Neck Parkway, that was eliminated because they claimed there wasn't enough ridership uh, on that bus. But to those seniors that relied on that bus, it was a lifeline. Yeah, I, I would say the, uh, and you raise a good point about the transit deserts, and I, one of the things that I think was uh, very uh, uplifting about the uh, Fix NYC panel 
and the members of it was that we moved away from parochial interests because this debate becomes much more challenging when you're focusing on any one particular parochial interest, either geography or industry, and take a step back and say what's important for our city as a whole. And I think to your point and, and Veronica's point, if we had a transit system that was reliable, that was a high quality, both buses and, and the, the, the subway system and covered areas that, that are more transit deserts today, people would opt to take public transit. We don't have that today. We have a system that's the slowest system uh, in the world, uh, that's the least reliable right now in the world, and so that's a challenge. And so the, the, the trick is to give ourselves a high quality public transit system that people can rely on and there'll be less in cars and more in public transit. Yeah, and, and let, let's get into that. Um, Veronica, with uh, the competing proposals and the competition is in some ways largely political uh, about who's supposed to pay for the emergency plan and then what's, what's required after the emergency plan. Do you believe that the money is out there um, in, in sufficient quantities under discussion to actually get the system to where it needs to be, to, to where it starts to turn around some of the numbers you cited up front? Not now. So we have a subway action plan that is $836 million, uh, but the proposed plan to fix the subways is $8 billion, and that funding has not yet been identified. The MTA is currently working on a 20-year needs assessment, which will inform the next construction program, the next five-year capital program. There's not enough money right now. So congestion pricing is one proposal, but it's not and shouldn't ever be the only revenue option. The last revenue option that was passed for the MTA was in 2009, and that was the payroll mobility tax. We keep talking about this option versus that option. We, frankly, need them all. At the same time, yes, we need reform at the MTA, and that is underway. Scott is helping to lead that as some as some others are. But there is not enough money. So focusing on just one revenue source as, as if that is the salvo is flawed and mistaken. It will not be. When, uh, the, the number you're talking about, that multi-billion dollar number, um, will that include uh, addressing some of the issues that that New York Times investigation uncovered about how project labor agreements are done with the MTA not at the table and uh, some of the other feather bedding and other cost overrun drivers that they, they identified? I don't know, because that $8 billion was put forth by Chairman Loda at the MTA. Um, I'm sure that it, it comes from some internal analysis. I'm not suggesting that it's a number taken out, but I don't know all the components that were factored into that $8 billion figure. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if yes. What I would say to this is that being a relatively newcomer to the MTA, not only do we need to reinvest uh, into our system, we need to reinvent how we invest, because it is a very broken system. It's a, uh, you know, a bureaucracy that's had decades and decades and layers and layers of internal processes and regulatory issues um, and, and uh, labor agreements that has made it incredibly inefficient. Uh, and we've, you know, we've heard all these different statistics, how it costs four times as much to actually build the mile of subway uh, in New York versus other uh, the cities like Paris and Tokyo. Uh, these are challenges. And uh, you know, I'm leading a group at the MTA that's a working group on trying to deal with these construction challenges. And I remember after our first meeting, going through the contracts, the procurement process, the change order process, and being in the business, and when I was, was going through it, you realize this is not about working and cutting around the edges or peeling back the onion. It's about throwing it out and starting over. Uh, it is so broken. It's impossible to try to reform it piece by piece. You have to say, what would you do if you were doing this again today? If you were taking a piece of paper that was blank and saying, what is the right procurement process? What is the right change order process? What would you put in place? Today, for example, just to give one example, if it takes nine months to get a change order approved on a project that the MTA is building. And the contract requires the contractor to continue building until the change order is approved, even though that he already knows, the contractor already knows they're gonna have to rip out everything they built once the, it is approved. And so it, it is, it, this is just one example of many examples uh, that exist there. And so you know, there's a, a group of you know, very well-intentioned leaders at the MTA that want to try to tame this beast, but it is a beast. Uh, and it's a cultural issue. And it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And so you know, one of the proposals that we put forward at the RPA, for example, was maybe not trying to, 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 in terms of the big bill, that $8 billion or whatever that number billed is, relying on the MTA, but taking a page out of uh, places like London that sets up a separate public benefits corporation 
that is now charged fresh without the historical layers of bureaucracy and, and agreements and says, how would you do this? What's the scope? How would you finance it? Could you use public-private partnerships um, and, and be uh, less affected by all the historical layers of bureaucracy that exist yes. at the MTA? Um, I, Assemblyman, I wanted to ask you, um, are you in favor of not tolling any bridges into the city? No, no, no. Uh, the tolls that are on the existing bridges have been there for, for many years, and uh, you know, I, I'm in favor of consumer choice. I want to keep some bridges free. But you know, I have an idea, which is not a new idea, but it's something that we had in our city uh, until about 19 years ago, and that's uh, the old commuter tax, the non-resident income tax. I have a bill in Albany uh, to have a 1% commuter tax. The old commuter tax was about a half a percent, and that 1% uh, would, would produce over a billion dollars in revenue, and my bill would, ha would have half of that money going to the MTA and the other half to New York City. Because after all, to me, that, that is a progressive tax. That is a tax that was fair when people had it uh, at the half a percent. Nobody complained about it. It wasn't a major issue. It became a political issue in a local state senate race in Rockland County. Uh, those uh, students of history in this uh, audience would remember. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a fair tax. Anybody that um, works in New York City and lives outside the city, spends their entire day in the city, relies on public transportation, relies on sanitation, relies on police and fire and everything else. And that would be the fairest way to pay for the MTA and to uh, solve some of the MTA's problems but by bringing back, why isn't there uh, you know, uh, a groundswell of support to bring back the non-resident income tax which is the fairest tax? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, a billion dollar tax in this election year is probably not going to necessarily go all that fast, right, through the legislature? Well, this next year, it doesn't have to be election year. <laughs> we, you know, this is a long-term project here. Okay. Uh, we, we need to look at a solution that is multifaceted, and that's what congestion pricing is. It's about addressing congestion and raising revenue at the same time. So if your focus is singular and just about ra raising revenue, then you can go with uh, an idea such as the commuter tax, or there's a, there are other ideas beside the assembly member that are just about raising revenue. But if you're looking more holistically at the problems that the city is facing across all industries and sectors, Congestion pricing is one way of tackling that. It is a multifaceted approach. It is not a singular approach. Okay. Um, I know many of you have uh, uh, questions and some expertise. And if you raise your hand, we have people circulating with mics. We'll have to wait till the mic gets to you because we are recording. Um, this gentleman here in the middle. And there's a t just tell us who you are. Uh, good morning. I'm John Raskin. I'm the executive director of the Riders Alliance. We're a grassroots organization of transit riders. Uh, my well, my first question is for all of you. How many of you took public transit to get here this morning? Ah, okay. So my, my second question is, shouldn't you all be members of the Riders Alliance? Um, <laughs> but my well, third a lot question, of my constituents couldn't make it because they couldn't get here. <laughs> but my third question is, is for the panel, um, which is this. You know, we've seen, I mean, we've been talking to legislators in Albany, we've been talking to a bunch of folks trying really hard to push for a transit funding solution, and we see greater openness now to this than we've ever seen before, but we're not quite there yet. Right? The state budget is due in less than a week, um, and, you know, by all accounts in the news media, et cetera, we're not quite there. So my question is, for the panelists who are kind of engaged in the process, what do you think is required to push something like this over the top, right? We need the billions of dollars so that we replace 1930s signal technology and the subways are functional and people can get to work and there's a willingness and people see the urgency. What do you think will do it? What do you think will actually get us there? Well, I have a, a more philosophical answer, which is going to be brief. I think we need an adherence to facts. Uh, assembly member, that analysis is based on census data that is not collected by any advocacy um, uh, organization uh, in, in original form, it's census data. And then secondly, we need courage. We need to be bold in this city and we need our elected officials to be bold. Uh, and we've not seen that vision in quite some time. Uh, I, I agree, but I, I'd also, Veronica made a point earlier that 11 years ago they began this process and when you speak to Mike Bloomberg and his team that worked on it, they were trying to warn and take proactive action to prevent the transit crisis that we're in today. We are in, we are in a transit crisis today, and almost everyone in this room or anyone that takes public transit or, or drives it up and down the streets uh, in New York City and Manhattan 
realizes we have a major problem. So I think the, the reality is, is this crisis and where you have these regular major breakdowns or major congestion where you miss meetings and things like that is creating the political will for people to realize they need to do something. If you're an elected official, uh, you have to make a decision. Are you gonna be proactive or are you gonna lead to put together a well thought out plan to solve the problem? Or are you gonna be in situations where subways are 40 minutes late, where you have fires on your tracks, where people can't get to work anymore, where the congestion's so bad, it's, you know, it's, it's almost Armageddon. And I think it's gonna get worse and worse, not better. I mean, we've seen, you know, we're, I, I would frame this right now, we have a subway system that's going through cardiac arrest. And you have the subway action plan that Chairman Loda put forward is trying to stabilize the patient, but that's not really fixing the problem. We still need to have open heart surgery and fix the problem once and for all. And that is the next phase of this thing. And so th I think the, the crisis, and that's unfortunately where our political system has come to, right? It's, it's really until we hit a crisis, do then we see the, the willingness of the leaders to come together and solve it. It's very hard to do it in a proactive, in advance of that crisis. And if I could just add to that, we keep talking about this conversation has been going on for years. So let's not act like Fix NYC is the only idea that's out there. I was up on a, Albany just a couple of weeks ago, and I think what we're seeing is there were some legislators that were for the Move New York legislation that was written a uh, couple of years ago and has been languishing up in Albany as well. And quite frankly, I think what the governor has seen by some reaction from the legislature and from my conversations up there, when we talk about core principles of the two plans, I think we're going to have to merge those together to bring the legislature along. And I think there's just more, a little more work that needs to be done, but those yeah. conversations and, are and ongoing. I think, and I think that's fair. I think, again, just again, the, the, at Fix NYC, when we first started this report, we had a much more prescriptive set of measures, and we tried to pull back and be more general on principles, recognizing that it's going to require compromise and open to compromise. Okay. Commissioner here. Thank you. Uh, Lou Riccio, former Transportation Commissioner and MTA board member. Uh, let's face the facts. Congestion is worse today than ever before because of one entity. It's not the trucks. It's not the people driving in from the outer boroughs. It's Uber, Lyft, Via, 100,000 more vehicles. They're damaging uh, uh, mass transit as well as filling up the streets. Just walk over to Broadway, count the vehicles with, with uh, TLC plates. Uh, they're the increment that's put us way over the top, not just in Manhattan, but in the boroughs. If you go to Brooklyn and Queens, traffic is a disaster out there as well because these cars are taking rides away from the MTA. The bus system is hurting in those areas because of Uber, Lyft, and Via. Uh, they're not paying. The taxis paid a million dollars entry. They pay $18,000 a year in total fees. Uber pays nothing. If you want to solve both the MTA's financing problem and the congestion problem, charge Uber, Lyft, Via. I'd rather see them go away, but I think you could charge them Uber, Lyft, Via, ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year. The cabs are already paying eighteen thousand. I don't see why they shouldn't pay at least ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year. You'd raise, raise between a half a billion, a billion dollars every year, forever. You'd have the money to straighten out the MTA. You'd bring down traffic. You'd let commerce continue the way it should continue. You'd free up street, street pace so the buses can function properly okay. again. Yeah, actually, the Assembly Democratic Majority Plan for this budget, uh, that is the, uh, the tax that they're proposing, uh, a tax on uh, Uber and Lyft and, uh, and app-based uh, uh, are, are the numbers taxes. in the same range the Commission was talking about? I don't know about the same range. It's a, it's a question of revenue and it's a question of the Senate and the Assembly, but uh, it's certainly a way to achieve revenue in this budget. It's on the same. TNCs have indeed contributed significantly. Uh, Bruce Schallard notes that 969 million miles have been driven by TNCs since 2013. As a result, a lot of people are turning to their cars. And I cited a statistic earlier that since 2012, personal auto registrations in New York City have increased 9%, which is why we cannot let that group off the hook either. While there has to be a charge on uh, for hire vehicles, TNCs, et cetera. We cannot neglect to charge those who are using their car, their personal car, to get in. 26% of people are driving into the CBD, according to NIMTIC, every single day. That 26% puts so much havoc on our economy. Let's just focus on the numbers. 
$20 billion a year in congestion costs. 91, million, 91 hours are lost by each person who's driving due to congestion. Hmm. Well, you have a question up front. Just, they'll bring you the mic. There you go. Hi, my name is Isabel Silverman, and I work for Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I just, something just struck me when the assembly member said about the nighttime deliveries for the trucks, and I had just a fairness, basic fairness reaction to it. So then these tr uh, people, the truckers and the stores receiving the deliveries now have to work at night and sleep during the day. You know, that's not so just that people with two cars can drive into the central business district for free. And that's a tremendous burden, of course, if you have to work at night and then you sleep when your family is awake during the day. So that just struck me as not fair. And uh, congestion pricing is a very progressive and fair model. And to your comment that this bus was canceled, the MTA bus was canceled because there was not enough ridership, then wouldn't with congestion pricing more people take this bus so the bus could actually be reinstated? And then also with Uber pool, people could actually take an Uber pool, which we know is very cheap, $2 to get to the closest subway stop and then go into the city with mass transit. And I just feel we cannot make policy on 4% of the people. We have to make policy on the majority of the needs of the people. Thank you. Well, I, I think she just said it was 23%, not 4%. Uh, 26% 26 are, are driving into the CBD. Where are they coming from if only 4% oh, is sorry. coming from Queens? Not into the, the other CBD, but people are coming into Manhattan and other areas of the borough with, with mass transit. So that number specific to the CBD. 96% of people are using public transportation in the five boroughs to commute. Okay, but the, the buses I refer to have nothing to do with people commuting into Manhattan. Those are just uh, people in Queens getting around in general. A lot of seniors going shopping, uh, going uh, you know, to stores uh, who rely on those buses instead of their cars, especially the senior population because generally seniors don't drive uh, as much as younger people just because their eyes aren't as good and, you know, and we don't necessarily want to encourage them uh, to drive, uh, you know, well into their 80s and 90s, but uh, it's certainly uh, a problem in Eastern Queens. Uh, it should be based on other factors as well, uh, quality of life factors, as opposed to just strictly numbers as far as ridership. Okay. Um, this gentleman here and then these two, I think we can squeeze in everybody in our last five minutes. Good morning. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Axel Carrion, United Parcel Service. Uh, just had a, a comment, a question about lockers that were mentioned. Uh, right now, we can't use those on city sidewalks. They have to be from property management, property management, and agreements. I'm just curious from the panel on how you see the use of technology, maybe utilizing some um, access space right now um, that's owned, uh, you know, for transit, maybe putting some lockers in bus locations or things of that nature that would reduce the inefficient areas, second, third attempts, that increase congestion, and also result of residents having to then go pick up their packages at local depots. So just thoughts on the use of technology, lockers, and maybe bring in some uh, assets to the organization at really no cost at all. It was just on a, a uh, private sector state. I totally agree, and I think that's part of this is both the private sector and the public sector have to come together and find ways to create a, to be able to adapt and incorporate these technologies. You know, one other example of how things are changing, right? We're building now in our multifamily properties uh, situations where they can have deliveries of, of foods and, and, and other uh, needs during the day. Someone comes in, they have an app, the person puts the app by the, by the lock, it notifies them on the iPhone, they permit it, the water goes in the refrigerator, the paper towels go in the cabinets, and you know, within five years, probably 70% of everyone's needs are gonna be delivered when you're not home. And so, you know, again, this all sort of speaks to changing behavior and using technology, and I think we're, we're one of the, the challenges that we're all discussing here right now is we're dealing with the broader challenge that we face as we enter the 21st century, and changes that technology are having in disrupting what was uh, the, the, the norms of the past. And unfortunately, when you have disruption like that, there are people and, and industries that get hurt more than others. And I think we as a society have to be sensitive to that and try to figure out how do we work our way through that transition in, in a way that continues progress, 
but thoughtful about the needs of those that are being disrupted. Absolutely. And We're going to take, um, see if we can squeeze in two more here. Hold on, hold on. Bill Murray from ACEC New York. We represent the consultant engineering profession and industry in New York uh, City and state. And I think people would have a greater level of comfort paying for congestion pricing if there was some confidence that the money would be well spent. You know, I, I know um, for an analogous situation, the city's system for, for water payment, right? We all pay a water bill and not all that money is spent on water infrastructure upkeep of it. So my question is, are you confident that the money, if, if revenues are generated by congestion pricing, will be put to, put to good use rebuilding our city's infrastructure? Uh, one, do you have that confidence? Is that conversation happening? And two, what's the best way to guarantee that? You know, I know there's no lockbox, um, people like to say, so. So the answer to number one is no. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of confidence, but the, to speak to your second portion of the question, I think there's opportunities to improve. There's no disagreement that more has to be done to better spend the MTA's resources. You hear it on the board, you hear it from the public, you hear it from elected officials, you hear it from the media, you hear it from the public, civic, and political space. There's, that's one area of consensus we, here. We all agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that, those reforms are underway. There was an attempt to lock box new revenues coming into the MTA. In 2011 and 2013, it was passed by the state legislature and vetoed by the governor. Uh, we need to have some sort of lock box mechanism, and no mechanism is truly lock box. But what has happened is revenues have been diverted away from the transit system significant amounts of revenue. Since 2009, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars have been diverted away. And that's because there is no sound lockbox mechanism. So as part of this discussion on congestion pricing, there has been an effort to tie how to better capture and protect those revenues. That has been part of the discussion. Uh, last question to Carl Weisbrod. Wait for a mic. There you go. Um, thank you. Carl Weisbrod, MTA board member. Assemblyman, I grew up in your district and um, commuted by mass transit well into my 20s and saw what happened to the transit system at that time. I dare say even today, the vast majority of your constituents, certainly friends, neighbors that I grew up with, would much rather see real change in the transit system than worries about the few people who would have to pay a little more to drive in, because most of them, most of my neighbors didn't drive in. But I do think that one of the things that struck me about all of you is that, um, Patrick talked about 8% of the, of, of the vehicles coming in are trucks, and so they're not the problem. 4% in your district assemblyman, so they're not the problem. Uber and Lyft are another part of the problem. I think. Yeah, there's a realization that all of these contribute to an overarching problem, and unless it's all addressed together, we're going to continue to have a problem. One of the uh, points that Scott Reckler has made, and I think is really important, is that this is a phased effort. You have to really start with a, an outline and a, and, a, and, a, and a general proposition. There are many complexities here that can get resolved over time as long as the authority to resolve them is granted by the legislature. And that really requires, and this would require, the city and state to work together in a way that I think would be beneficial to both the MTA, city residents, and city of New York. So that to me is, a, is, is really the overarching goal here. I will say one other thing, Assemblyman. Um, I do think the transit desert in eastern Queens really has to be addressed. But the MTA today doesn't have the resources to address that. And unless it does, I think uh, it's going to continue to be a problem. And I think one of the first things that congestion pricing can do is to improve bus service, particularly in transit deserts, and particularly because it's certainly close to me in your district. So. Thank you. Okay, a great note on which to end. I want to um, thank everybody for, uh, for participating. We're going to um, have to pick this up another time. Thanks very much to our panel. Scott Weckler, Veronica Vanderpool, 
David Weprin, and Patrick Hyland.